Today, I'm going to share with you the most powerful spiritual practice and concept that I've ever come across throughout my entire journey. So this way of viewing reality, viewing our emotional experiences, our thoughts, the situations that we find ourselves in is actually how I survived some of the most difficult periods of purification that came with my Kundalini awakening process. It's a very powerful ideas that I'm going to share with you today, and it's, it's why I want to pass them along to you. So what I'm going to share may address some of your burning questions and some of your confusion around things like what is the nature of reality? You know, what is the point of meditation? What does it really mean to be unconditionally loving? Um, we're also going to talk about how to accept some of the uncomfortable, negative, difficult experiences that we can have, including some of the encounters that we may have with other people as well. So this is a, a universal practice that can be applied to any and everything that we may come across throughout our lives whether it's internal experiences or external experiences. So before we get into that, as always, I want to invite you to check out brentspirit.com. I've got a few free programs available there. I've also got a brand new course called Grounded, Spiritual Emergence and Integration. It's got eight hours of material related to how to find energetic balance, uh, how to find safety in the body, how to heal with unconditional love, some of the ideas that we're going to talk about here today. It's meant to uh, support you post-spiritual awakening because, of course, that can be a very difficult time period, very confusing, very challenging with a lot of different uncomfortable, messy, uh, quote-unquote, symptoms. And so this this course, Grounded, is, is meant to uh, support you. So now that that's out of the way, let's dive into this diagram that I've got here next to me. And let's look at how you can use these concepts to move very quickly through whatever difficulty you may be facing in your life. So I'm going to narrate uh, this message here today for those listening on audio alone. Uh, I'll describe a little bit about this diagram that I have here. It's, it's pretty simple. In short, there's a full spectrum of light with rainbow colors with white at the very top. Now I've labeled the white portion as awareness and next to the word awareness we've got the icon of an eye. And this of course represents the state of witnessing consciousness or observing or watching or being aware without judgment. Now, of course, if you've been hanging around spirituality for a while, you must be familiar with this idea of awareness. Maybe you've got some experience with it through any meditation or mindfulness practice. If not, no worries. We can tap into this part of your being right now, this awareness part of your being. So let's do a little exercise here very briefly. Just take notice of your breathing without any intention here to change it or to control it. What part of you is noticing your breathing? Now you can take a moment to notice any feelings in your body. Maybe you're calm. Maybe you're tense. Maybe your clothes are touching your skin. Just notice any of these things that are happening within your body. What part of you is noticing these experiences, these sensations, these emotions or feelings in your body. Now do the same with your thought stream. Can you notice a thought? Can you witness a thought? Can you become aware of thinking that may be happening in your mind? Just observe the mind, observe the thought stream. Almost as if you've taken a step back from it almost as if it was somebody else talking to you on the other side of the room. Just listen, just become aware. So now this practice may be a little harder to witness the thoughts, to witness the mind, as opposed to something more visceral and less emotional, such as your breath, for example. Now, if you find it to be difficult to witness the mind and the thoughts, it's okay. Thoughts are often, you know, very uh, intense, very... Uh, attractive, we can become identified with them and we can lose that witnessing presence and that's okay. The more you practice awareness, the more you practice things like mindfulness and meditation and being, being aware of the, your experience, the easier this will become. But that's the awareness aspect of your being. It's the witnessing presence. It's of course here on the diagram represented by the white portion of this entire spectrum of light. Now beneath the white portion we have everything in existence and of course that's labeled with the rainbow letters on the side here that says everything 
in existence. Okay, so the full color spectrum, every color of the rainbow and everything in between is all representation of everything in existence. And I literally mean everything in the most literal, extreme, exaggerated way even. Nothing is excluded from this full spectrum of rainbow colors, this full spectrum of light. Pain, pleasure, hatred, fear, your favorite person, your worst enemy, sickness, health, poverty, wealth, nature, a torture chamber, birth, death, everything. It's all there. Everything. Nothing is not included. Anything you can possibly think of. The most amazing things, the most dreadful, horrendous, uncomfortable, dark things. It's all there represented here in this rainbow spectrum of light. Okay, this is all of existence that we're talking about here. So if you look at the words that I put on this, this rainbow spectrum, you'll see, you know, I've written karma, I've written joy, I've written pain, I've written ego. And I've put them in, in any sort of position. I've got pain towards the top. I've got pleasure at the very bottom. My idea here is to not put these emotional experiences or these uh, parts of life on a hierarchy as if one is better than another. If, if, if some, all the good, comfortable ones and ideal ones are at the top and all the difficult, painful ones are at the bottom. Sometimes we see diagrams kind of like this that represent you know, the vibrational frequency of emotions and whatnot. But my intention here is to scatter them all over, to strip away this idea that some are higher or lower than others because that is what causes a lot of difficulty for those on the spiritual path when they're approaching healing okay because they may feel as if some emotions are lower frequency or some emotions are because they're still asleep or or whatever it is and so this is what causes a lot of resistance towards those emotions and experiences themselves so my intention here is to really say all are welcome all are included it doesn't matter how they may feel everything's included pain pleasure hate love joy everything okay so this is really key for this concept to make sense and to be applied Every single thing exists in this rainbow spectrum of light. Nothing is not included. So just by that concept alone, you may already get a general idea of where we're going with this, but let's keep going, okay? So now that you've got an overview of the diagram, let's talk about some more key notions in spirituality in general. So firstly, I'm sure that you've heard this, everything is one. Everything is interconnected. Everything is divine. Everything is God. Of course, this is a fundamental fundamental theme that we find in spirituality. Of course, we see that in the diagram here. Though there are distinct colors, they're all connected via a spectrum, a gradient spectrum. No color exists in isolation. In the same way, no experience, thought, person, uh, emotion, feeling exists in isolation. Nothing is separate. All is interconnected in some way, including the difficult, uncomfortable things. Okay, all is one. Once again, like I'm saying, even the ugly stuff, even jealousy, even frustration, it's all included here. Everything is one. Okay. Secondly, in spirituality, you must have also heard this. Everything is energy. Everything is light vibrating at different frequencies. And the different frequencies are what give rise to the different manifestations that we see in the world, whether it's a thought, whether it's an emotion, whether it's an object, a person, all these things are light vibrating at different frequencies. It's one spectrum of light showing up in different ways. Okay, so let's use the term light just to keep it simple. We're going to get more into this. So everything is light vibrating at different frequencies and it's all one. Now, here's another very common word that we see in spirituality and particularly uh, from yoga. It's the word namaste. It's a Sanskrit word. It comes out of India. Namaste. Now, this is commonly used as a greeting between two people. Of course, it means the light in me recognizes and sees the light in you. Namaste. Okay. So now here's where unconditional love comes into this picture. Now, in my view, this concept, this word namaste is an expression of unconditional love. The light in me sees the light in you. This is an expression of unconditional love. So one time I asked Source, you know, I was in a meditative state, I was very in tune, and I asked Source, you know, what is love? And I heard back, 
Love is divinity recognizing divinity. So love, in other words, is God recognizing God. Love is God seeing God. Namaste means the God in me sees the God in you. Of course, we can replace the word God with the light because God is light. Light is all there is. God is all there is. The divine is all there is. But we're going to use the word light as we explore this. So the light in me sees the light in you. The divinity in me recognizes the divinity in you. This is what unconditional love is. So it's when one aspect of the light recognizes another aspect of the life of the light as itself without judgment. So now let's look back to our diagram here. So of course the white portion is awareness, we have the icon of an eye. So now you remember the awareness exercise that we did at the beginning a few minutes ago. So when that part of you, the awareness part of you, is able to recognize that anything in your experience is part of the light too, this is an act of unconditional love. So if that awareness part of you is able to look within your body and see that there's a thought and to say, okay, yeah, this thought is also part of the light because everything is light. That's love. That's how we love a thought. That's how we say namaste to a thought. That's how we unconditionally accept a thought. And we can do it to an emotion in our body, a painful emotion, a beautiful emotion. We look at it and we say, this too is part of the light. We don't judge it. We don't push it away. This is unconditional love. And this is how we're able to heal with the power of unconditional love. But of course, this is also where it gets hard. This is where it gets difficult, but infinitely rewarding if we're courageous enough to go through with this practice. So it's very easy for the light to recognize the light in a joyful thought, in a pleasurable sensation, in a friendly person, in a beautiful scene in nature, and so on. It's very easy for us to sit in awareness and look and experience and feel and say, ah, yes, of course, this is part of the light. It feels so good. It looks so beautiful. It's not fighting me. It's not threatening me. It doesn't hurt. It's not uncomfortable. Of course, this is part of the light. Namaste. I love you. It's so easy to do that with, with comfortable things. But what about the ugly things, the painful things, the uncomfortable things, right? What about those things? Are they not part of the light? Of course they are. Because according to our diagram here, everything is part of the light. Pain is a part of the light. The ego is part of the light. Trauma is part of the light. Ideas, good, bad, good ideas, bad ideas, hateful ideas, violent ideas, genius ideas. It's all part of the light. However, it's a lot harder to abide as awareness, to rest as that, observer, that witness, and to look at a painful sensation or emotion in our body and say, Namaste, painful feeling. Namaste, painful emotion. I see you as an aspect of the light. Namaste. It's hard because we've been conditioned to view the world through the lens of separation, right? It's easy to see that joy, peace, pleasure, and your pet even are all interconnected and part of the light. But the way that we view reality is through the lens of separation often. And so we want to separate the good from the bad, separate the comfortable from the uncomfortable. So we want to compartmentalize reality. And that's why we get into trouble. That's why we have difficulty. Okay. But often when we have a, a, a negative thought, a painful thought, a painful feeling or emotion, rather than seeing it all as one and not accepting it unconditionally, not seeing it all as a light, often what we're inclined to do is to avoid those feelings, avoid those thoughts by either ignoring them, pretending they're not there, or in other words, not bringing our unconditional awareness to them. Or if we do become, our, become aware of these negative experiences within our body or within our life, sometimes we add conditions onto them. Sometimes we add resistance and we say, these things are bad. These things are uncomfortable. They're negative. And therefore, they're separate from God, separate from the divine, separate from the light, simply because they don't make me feel good. Because somehow we've bought into this idea that God, that the, the divine, 
is all blissful, peaceful, joyful, amazing, incredible, and everything else must be something different, something else. As if there is something else in existence other than God, other than the light. There's only one thing here, and it's, it's the divine, and it includes everything. And this is where we have to be a little flexible, have to be a little bit mature enough to expand our definition of what the light is, of what God uh, includes. So this resistance, this judgment towards difficult things is actually what perpetuates them within our system. This is what keeps them bottled up. When they arise, uh, they get you know, out of whack, they, they, they get expressed in, in very difficult, messy ways. Um, this is why some people turn towards um, different vices in order to shut these things out because they're not willing or able to recognize that there's nothing wrong with these things that are actually part of the light. So now that we've got these ideas, how can we heal these uncomfortable things? Well, we can heal them by giving them the recognition that they deserve, by seeing them as what they really are, by saying namaste, by saying, I love you to all of these difficult, ugly, messy, negative, uncomfortable things. Now, I know, I know this sounds absolutely outrageous. You know, why and how could we possibly say, I love you or, or namaste to a painful sensation in our body or an emotion or a thought or an experience or even a person? Well, like I was saying, it requires courage. And this, this message here is an invitation for you to give it a try and to tap into this power. Because like I said, it's the most powerful healing concept and practice that I've come across through my entire journey. So it requires courage to do this. It requires courage to look at something uncomfortable, something difficult, and to say, yes, you two are part of the light. Now, courage is a quality of the heart. You know, we talk about the courage of a lion, the heart of a lion. The word courage comes from the French word cur which translates in English to heart. So we have to find courage. And this is where love really comes in. This is how I would define love. It's, it's the courage to offer it to things that, you know, may not be easy to love. But that's where, you know, we're invited to go to higher levels on our spiritual path and spiritual development. So you see, when you say namaste to something uncomfortable, when you say I love you to something negative, this just means that you have the maturity and the courage to say, yes, this experience is not ideal. It doesn't feel good, but it's still part of the spectrum of light. That's good sportsmanship. That's playing fair, right? If you're playing sports and you make a foul and you fess up to it, you own it, that's playing fair. It's good sportsmanship. You don't like it. You don't like to fess up. It doesn't feel good to. You feel maybe afraid of doing that. You feel maybe embarrassed or ashamed. It doesn't feel good. You're not celebrating your mistakes. But there comes great courage in saying, yeah, I'm going to play fair. These uncomfortable things, they're also part of the light. That's what it means to have courage here. And it doesn't mean that we have a whole party around these uncomfortable things. It doesn't mean we celebrate them. We just own up to them and say, yeah, yeah, this too is part of the light in some way. It doesn't feel good, but it's still part of the light. So that's all these negative things are really asking of us. That's all they're asking of us. They don't even want us to, to like, you know, go out and act on some of our, our negative emotions or thoughts. That's not what they're asking. They just want to be recognized as part of the light without being avoided, ignored, suppressed, denied, or even um, coming at these difficult experiences with an attempt to change them, right? To change them and transform them into something more comfortable. They don't want that. They want to be recognized as they are without judgment, as part of the light, okay? So these things arise just to be seen, just to be acknowledged. They just want to be recognized as what they really are. Like I'm saying, you know, they don't want a whole party. We don't have to celebrate difficult emotions. We don't have to say, yay, I'm feeling frustrated. This is amazing. This is part of the light too. You know, we don't have to dance. We just have to recognize that these difficult things arising are also part of the light. So it's a very neutral stance, a neutral but honest stance, okay? We also don't have to find comfort in these difficult emotions. We don't have to try and find uh, how to sit with something like frustration in our body 
and find comfort in it. That's not even what we're asking. It's even it's even more simple and basic than that. We can sit uncomfortably and say, I don't like this feeling. This doesn't feel good in my body. These thoughts, I can't stop them. They don't feel good. But I'm still going to recognize that they're part of life by saying namaste, uncomfortable thought. Namaste, painful emotion. I see you. I love you. You're not separate from the lights, but you're still uncomfortable. I would prefer if you left, sure. But I do recognize your true nature, which is, of course, part of the light. So that's where courage and maturity comes in. And so in doing so, in, in offering these difficult emotional experiences, thoughts, maybe even situations, people, et cetera, and offering them the recognition of what they really are as their true nature as part of the light, as existing on this full rainbow spectrum of light, we actually allow them to arise fully and wholly and completely into our awareness, which is, of course, the white portion arise fully into the white light without avoidance, without ignoring them, without trying to change them, just letting them arise as they are into the light of our awareness. And that's how they can be released from our system, released and healed and forgiven. This is healing because that light of awareness is is almost like a pure white burning fire. Anything that comes into it without um, any uh, of our own doing, which is trying to avoid it from coming into our awareness directly to be seen as what it really is, that white light purifies it, burns it up, cleanses it. This is the the practice of healing. This is how we heal with unconditional love. So on the spiritual path, we're being called to expand our window of acceptance, patience, and tolerance for the things that arise within our experience. Now, ironically, some spiritual teachings, some ideas seem to imply that everything on the path should be peaceful, joyful, blissful, and if you're not experiencing that, well, then you must be doing something wrong. You must not be a good, uh, you know, traveler of the spiritual path. You know, we see sometimes these ideas almost like, you know, everything is love and light, love and light. No negative vibes, no bad vibes around here. Don't lower vi- my vibration. Don't, uh, um, you know, bring me down to the level of ego or to the level of pain, right? So we have these sort of spiritual ideas that completely dismiss the uncomfortable parts of life, uncomfortable sides of life. And this is really unhealthy because it's absolutely impossible. It's absolutely impossible as a human being because as a human being, we will always have access to the full range of emotional experiences from the most uncomfortable to the most joyful, blissful, ecstatic. And so it doesn't matter how awakened we are, how spiritual we are, the full of the full range of emotions is always available. Now, that doesn't mean that we're going to experience everything on that full range um, equally or as often or very intensely. In fact, the more that we practice recognizing even the difficult things as part of the light, I, paradoxically, they, they seem to arise um, with less intensity once we've moved through them. But the willingness here is to say, yeah, it doesn't matter how spiritually evolved I am. I'm fully willing to feel totally frustrated, totally jealous, totally angry, sad, depressed. It's all welcome here because any emotion, thought, or feeling is part of the light. Full acceptance, full tolerance, uh, a high degree of patience and maturity is actually the paradox. When you're fully willing to be angry and depressed and upset, then you can actually move into more comfortable and ideal emotions more easily. Okay? So if we can personify a negative emotion just to just to give another picture of how this looks let's personify an emotion like jealousy okay so when i say personify i mean turn it into almost like a character like a person okay so we all carry a little child inside of us named jealousy now maybe jealousy was born when we saw another kid with a toy that we wanted but we couldn't have and so maybe we cried about it we felt jealous and we maybe went to our parents, we said, you know, I feel this way. I want what they have. And maybe our parents didn't validate this experience, this, this inner child of jealousy within us. They never maybe, they maybe never explained to us that, you know, jealousy is, is a valid and normal part of life. Everybody has different things. Sometimes people are going to have things that we want. We can't have them. This is normal. It's natural. It's okay to be jealous at times, right? Instead, our parents said, no, you can't be jealous. That's wrong. That's unfair. It's, it's unjust. Look at all the toys you have. Your emotion is invalid. It's wrong. Don't feel that way. Right? And so then we became confused by jealousy's uncomfortable presence within our minds, within our bodies. We felt that there was a mistake. 
we felt that we shouldn't feel this way because like our parents said, we shouldn't feel this way because we've got all the toys already. We've got so many different toys of our own. So it doesn't make sense for us to feel jealous. So our this idea of jealousy within our body, this little child called jealousy wasn't validated, right? Now, later on, as we grow up into adults, jealousy may arise again. And so now we may feel like, okay, well, I need to do something to get rid of jealousy. I can't turn to my parents. Of course, I'm an adult. I have to do something for myself. So maybe we go out and we try to satisfy jealousy by giving jealousy some, some new toys, some new experience. Maybe it's you know, a new car or a dirt bike or something, you know? try to satisfy jealousy because maybe our friends have these things that we want. So maybe we keep up with the Joneses in this way. We're trying to soothe our own jealousy. So trying to soothe this character named jealousy. Maybe we want to also be seen and recognized by others. So we flaunt things around, right? We want others to see it, to then soothe jealousy within us, to make jealousy go away, to transform and change jealousy because we don't feel jealousy has a place within our experience, right? Also, Maybe we try to get jealousy to shut up. Jealousy sometimes speaks, sometimes gets moving in our body, makes us feel tense, makes us feel tight, makes us feel down. Thoughts may arise. I want this. I want this. I can't have that. Why do those, why do those people get and I don't? So maybe what we do to shut jealousy up is we maybe turn to drugs or alcohol or some other form of addiction. Okay. But of course, jealousy can never be soothed, never be satisfied because jealousy by their very nature but their very fundamental essence is jealous and jealousy will always be jealous and we can't change. We can't transform it. We can't. That's what jealousy is. So the invitation here is to acknowledge jealousy for who they are within our system without judgment. Why don't we give ourselves the validation that we didn't receive as a child when we were jealous? So all it takes is to just allow jealousy a moment in the light of our meditative awareness of the white portion of the spectrum, of that purifying white light, we allow jealousy to, to walk right into the awareness and to be fully present and expressive in our body, in our mind. We let jealousy speak. We let jealousy tighten our body, make us feel down, all of that. Because that's all that jealousy really wants. All jealousy wants is to have its moment in the light to be recognized that it's not separate from all the other emotions. Jealousy feels left out. Because all throughout our life, we've openly welcomed joy, pleasure, bliss, excitement. We left jealousy out. So jealousy feels abandoned, isolated. And that's why jealousy continues to come around trying to get our attention, our awareness, our unconditional attention, our love. Jealousy just wants recognition. And so when we say namaste to jealousy, in other words, when we say the light in me the light of my awareness in me recognizes the light in you, jealousy. Of course, then jealousy says, oh, thank you for finally accepting me as I am without trying to change me, without trying to ignore me. Thank you for finally validating my existence and recognizing that I'm also part of the full spectrum of light, just like every other emotion, thought, or feeling. So that's how then jealousy is able to, to walk away, to leave our system in other words, we're able to heal from the painful emotion that we call jealousy, okay? And so if we look at it in this way, it's almost kind of sad. It's like, oh, this poor, this poor child named Jealousy. All the other children got attention, but Jealousy never did. And Jealousy never did anything wrong. Jealousy just being who they are at their core essence, which is, of course, jealous. But there's nothing wrong with that. It's, it's a normal part of the human experience, right? And so if we give ourselves permission to allow those parts of us come to light. This is how we heal with unconditional love. And we can do this with anger. You know, we can do it with rage, with boredom, with frustration. It doesn't matter. All we have to do is see these things as they are without judgment. Everything is part of the light. And if that idea of personifying them, maybe as small children, helps you, it sort of evokes the compassionate, caring part of you that, you know, wants to care for children. Even when children are, are being bad, we still love them. We still, you know, honor their, their, their uh, innate innocence. It's the same, same way with these emotions. We just want to honor their innate uh, connection to the light. And of course, you know, this is a really powerful practice. And it's so powerful that it actually even applies to the parts of us that are doubtful or even bored of the practice itself. So maybe we're sitting with, with what's arising. 
and we're like, I don't like this practice. It doesn't make sense. I don't like it. It's dumb. I don't want to do it. It's wasting my time. Or if it's like, oh, this is so boring. You know, why aren't we, you know, doing some chakra visualization or some mantras or, you know, doing some movements? This is really boring. Just sitting here and allowing all the things arising in me and seeing them as part of light. We can actually take a step back and say, oh, those thoughts are also part of the light. The thoughts that want to resist the practice are also not separate from the divine. So we can always take a step back and look at those thoughts and say, oh yeah, these thoughts are here and they're welcome too. Because that's all they want. They don't want, so a thought of, of boredom that wants to get involved or that seems to uh, want to lead us to escaping the meditation, for example, and to get involved in some sort of other activity. It doesn't actually want us to get involved in another activity. It just wants to be seen. And so we can serve it in the meditation by, so by recognizing that, oh, even this thought of restlessness, even that's part of the light too. So everything can be digested or metabolized in this field of awareness just by recognizing that everything we can experience inwardly or externally is all part of the light. So it's the paradox. This is how we can, all, we can release all of these things with just simply seeing them as they are. Now we can also use this practice with another person, even our worst enemy. So we can sit in meditation and we can imagine their face arising in our mind's eye. And with courage, with bravery, you know, we can take the high road and we can say in our mind's eye, not directly to the person, but in our mind's eye during our meditation, we can say, you've hurt me. It's difficult for me to do, but I still see you as part of the light because I recognize that the light is all there is. So as we do this, can watch how things like resentment, hatred, and fear begins to dissolve around a relationship with this other person. Maybe it's our worst enemy. Of course, you don't have to say anything to, to the person directly. And still you can experience what I would call true forgiveness without actually having a conversation with them. Now, of course, I must add here that we don't use this type of practice to justify abuse. Okay. So yes, everything is part of the light because the light is all there is. Even abusers are part of the light. So let that sink in for a moment here. Even abusers are part of the light. It takes real maturity to see that, yes, even an abuser is part of God. Yeah, not easy to say. You know, I feel a little bit resistance even saying that. But if we return back to our fundamental principle that we explore in spirituality, the light is all there is. The divine is all there is. So even an abuser is as divine as, you know, a great saint because the light is all there is on the most fundamental level. So when we hear these things, our knee-jerk reaction may be to protest against, you know, such a statement like abuser is part of the light or abuser is part of the divine. You know, our knee-jerk reaction may be to say, no, how? How could it be? You know, how can Brent be saying this? Something wrong with him. He's lost his mind. But this is the invitation here. To be courageous enough to drop all judgment, all notions of separation, because the light is all there is. And the light can sometimes be dim. Sometimes it can be uncomfortable. It can be painful, violent, traumatic, terrible, terrible. But it's still light because the light is all there is. Or, of course, the light can be bright and pleasant. Now, even though I'm saying here that, yes, an abuser is still part of the light, even though I'm saying, yeah, the invitation is to, to have courage and be brave and to see them as part of the light, that does not mean that we give abusers a free pass or that we stay in abusive situations and use these ideas of oneness and acceptance and forgiveness as justification to allow abuse to continue, okay? Absolutely not. If you're in an abusive situation, your role is to leave, Okay? That's the spiritual lesson in abusive situations. Leave. Get help. Get support. Turn to someone you can trust. Find a safe place. Leave the situation. We don't use these ideas to spiritually bypass and put ourselves in harm's way or you know, use these to actually harm others, right? To say, oh, I'm going to punch you in the face. I'm going to punch you, but everything is part of light, including the punch. You know, namaste. No, we don't do that. Um, but we also don't use spiritual ideas to stay in difficult, abusive situations. Okay. 
once you're safe, once you've gotten out of the abusive situation, during the healing process that will follow, at your own pace, at your own pace, whenever you feel ready after leaving a situation like that, for example, which may be years from now, it may come with the support of a community, a therapist, um, a, a mentor, family, friend, a partner, etc. Then you can practice these ideas that I'm sharing about love and forgiveness for the abuser from a safe distance. Okay, so keep that in mind. This does not happen in the midst of abuse. We must must take space to find safety and then we can bring in these practices when we feel ready okay of course it doesn't matter that everything is part of light of course it all is but we still have to honor our human life we still have to prioritize our own safety we still have to protect others that depend on us or that need our protection uh, of course we have to protect ourselves and when necessary we seek justice for those that commit abuse okay none of that ever gets trumped by spiritual concepts. This is the real world. Difficult, messy things happen and we do have to take the proper course of action. We still have to take help and all of that, okay? It's during the healing phase, once we're out of those situations, that we can then begin to explore these spiritual concepts like this one that we're talking about here with the diagram for healing and development, okay? So now a quick point about the Kundalini Awakening process. So of course, you must know that during Kundalini Awakening, the energy begins to rise through the spinal column, through each of our chakras, and it will begin to bring up things from deep within our nervous system, deep within our muscles, deep within our chakras, our psyche, our memory. All that's going to start to come up to be released and healed. So this is when this concept of, of looking at things with unconditional love as part of the light, even the most uncomfortable, messy things, is absolutely necessary. Quite frankly, I don't know any other way to get through some of the most intense purification parts of the Kundalini Awakening journey without some iteration of this concept here, without some form of unconditionally accepting of all that may arise, okay? So the Kundalini process asks us, or dare I say even forces us to be courageous and mature enough to see beyond just black and white thinking, black and white labels, this is good, this is bad, and to actually see that all is one, it's all a full spectrum, including the uncomfortable parts of life. So this is how we can allow the purging and purification to carry itself out without delaying this process, without interrupting this process. And so we, we drop all resistance and we allow these things to come up to be released. So this is my invitation to you. Can you see everything as part of the light, as part of the divine spectrum of light? Can you see the parts of you that find this invitation daunting as also valid parts of the light? I think it's valid. It's a very difficult practice. And if parts of you arise that say, I don't like this, it's too difficult, it's messy, I don't want to do it, I'd rather ignore, I'd rather label, I'd rather avoid, I'd rather escape some of the difficult experiences that are arising within me. I think that's valid because it's all valid. It's all part of the light. It's just at our own pace with courage when we're ready and our heart is able to, to hold everything in it, no matter how difficult, how painful. And that's how we advance on our spiritual journey. That's how we heal a lot very, very quickly. So let me know your thoughts, questions, feedback, and experiences around all of this. Like I said, you can visit brentspirit.com for my free programs. Uh, the course that I mentioned, Grounded, Spiritual Emergence and Integration, it includes some of these concepts as well. We go a little deeper. We talk a lot more about also soothing the nervous system and finding safety on a visceral, physical level in the body. So we can also address some of the adverse effects of having too much spiritual energy up in the head feeling ungrounded, feeling depersonalized, dissociated, getting loopy thoughts, anxious thoughts, insomnia, um, you know, having a lot of head pressure. So all of that is also addressed in this course. We go really deep over eight hours. Check it out, brentspirit.com. It's where you can also find out how to meet with me one-on-one. -on -one. Or if you feel called to make a donation, brentspirit.com. Thank you so much for all of your support. Until next time, namaste. Much love and peace.